calorimetry and stoichiometry, lecture number 23. <clears throat> so in the last lecture we introduced this idea of thermodynamics or thermochemistry where we're not only studying the chemical reactions that occur but we're looking at the energy that's involved in those reactions. So we talked in the last time about energy and that the changes in energy can be followed by looking at two different quantities, the amount of heat that's transferred and the amount of work that's done. In addition, we looked at a little bit more closely at the work, and especially this pressure volume work. We did some calculations there. So the majority of today's lecture is going to be talking about that other component, that heat. We showed that the heat can be related to this enthalpy. We'll get to enthalpy in more detail later, but right now we're just going to follow that transfer of heat directly, that Q value. And we're going to do that using a process called calorimetry. So calorimetry is <clears throat> just following those heat reactions so we can determine the amount of heat that's involved in reaction, lost or gained, by looking at the specific heat or the heat capacity, the amount, the ability of that substance to hold heat times the amount of that substance we have. Sometimes we'll combine those two. Plus Overall, since we said the temperature is a measurement of heat, or so how we follow heat, we're going to look at the change in temperature. So we're going to, when we talk about this calorimetry, we're using this equation here, Q equals Cm delta T. <clears throat> Sometimes we'll see the C is an S. But we're looking at how well something holds heat times how much of it is times the temperature change that we observe. So we have these two different uh, values here. We have the specific heat capacity, which is the which is the lowercase c is the substance uh, is the quantity of heat required to change the temperature of one gram of a substance by one K or one degree Celsius. Compare that to the molar heat capacity, this uppercase C, where we're not talking about it, it's the same the, the amount of heat required to change now instead of a gram, a mole. So the molar heat capacity we're talking about moles specific heat capacity we're talking about mass. But we're always talking about how much energy it takes to raise that quantity by one degree Celsius or Kelvin. Right. <clears throat> so we're going to be able to follow that and <clears throat> if we combine these two things like one material that we're interested in and we put it in remember that the amount of heat lost by the system has to be the amount of heat gained by the surrounding. So if we can follow one of those two things, we can relate it then to the other. And there are two different techniques, well one technique, two different sort of devices we use to do this calorimetry. <clears throat> These are the two calorimeters. So you can see here we have the two calorimeters. We have on this side the coffee cup calorimeter. It's a simple device, it's typically what you'll use in lab if you do this in lab, <clears throat> right? Where we are measuring in this case, our system is some sample that we put in our calorimeter that surroundings, we are saying, is water. The coffee cups are insulating the rest of the universe from that, so we can only focus on that amount of water. So then if we can figure out how much energy or heat the water gained, we can relate to how much energy then that the system, our sample, lost. So we're going to set those two equal to each other and then figure out um, the amount of heat that's changed. These coffee cup calorimeters are where we have a constant pressure, so the pressure isn't changing. It's fairly simple. <clears throat> Another one you can see here is this balm calorimeter. It's a very similar device. Right? We're still measuring the heat lost by a system, but now it's a sealed container, so the volume is the only thing that stays constant. As the reaction occurs, the pressure can change, which means that you can have to correct um, for that changing pressure when you do the calculation, or you can simplify it a little bit like they do in the text. Either way, we're going to follow the amount of heat by looking at the temperature change. So for example, <clears throat> how much heat is given off when an 869 gram iron bar cools from 94 degrees Celsius to 5 degrees Celsius, where this S, or the specific heat capacity of iron, is 0.444 joules per gram degree C. <coughs> right, so if we do that, we're going to take the mass times the specific heat times this temperature change, 
remember it's final temperature minus initial temperature so our final volume temperature was five degrees our initial was 94 so that is going to be give us it's cooling down so that temp heat is being lost by our system so we expect a negative number and in fact we get a negative number you can see here a negative 3.43 times 10 to the fourth joules <clears throat> negative says that that's is being lost we can follow that because the temperature change is going or the temperature is going down right if we have if we followed the water we could then set say the amount of heat lost by this substance would be gained by something else we can still make that comparison remember these are tied so if one thing loses heat the other is going to gain heat right? the system versus the surroundings right? <coughs> the calculations for this are fairly straightforward the, the more complicated part about this is the way we arrange things so we, wherever we are we following the surroundings are we following the system and what information are we trying to gain out of that right? <coughs> so let's then take this idea of this energy and expand it back to the chemistry. Right? So we can now develop what we call a thermal chemical equation. It's a balanced chemical equation that includes the amount of heat transferred or this enthalpy change of the reaction. Right? <clears throat> and the sign, since our system is then this reaction, the signs can ind indicate whether it's an exothermic versus endothermic. We talked about this before. <clears throat> but not only that, the sign will also tell us where that heat is. Is it a reactant or is it a product? If we are adding heat to the system, right, we can treat that heat as a reactant, and that's an endothermic reaction. So heat is a reactant, and the sign would be positive. If we give off heat, heat leaves the system, we can treat that heat as a product, and the sign is negative, and that's an exothermic reaction. So an endothermic reaction, Delta H, the sign of the enthalpy is a positive, and it, we can treat it as a reactant. In an exothermic reaction, that heat is leaving the system, so it's a product, and this sign is negative. Right? But regardless, <coughs> we this enthalpy is proportional to the amount of substance that's being consumed. So we can then treat it just like a product or a reactant we normally would, and we can do that corresponding stoichiometry with it. Right? So this gives, gives us another then way we can relate not only what substances are changing, but we, we can also talk about pressure or volume, remember, or we can talk about concentrations. But once we get to those substances, we can do a mole-to-mole -mole conversion from one substance to another, and then we can also then include this heat <coughs> because of this enthalpy information. Right? So we can use a mole-to-mole -mole ratio in the stoichiometry. So this stoichiometry you're going to see is going to go through all of these different things. We're just sort of adding to our ability from that basic understanding of that mole-to-mole -mole conversion. Dad, I didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs>